We're speaking with Chris Martinson, who's in studio with us today. Chris is a trained research scientist, and you make it a point to say you are not an economist. And so why is that a big deal to you? It seems in preparing for this interview, I, saw, I see you mention that on your website, and you've said it in some other interviews. Why is that so important? I want to be absolutely clear about who I am and who I'm not. I do talk about the economy a lot. It's absolutely something I'm... I think we should switch mics, because for some reason we're getting a little feedback on his there. There we go. That's going to be better. And just talk very cl as close as you want to get with the mic. Put it wherever is convenient. There we go. Good. So uh, it's Much very, better. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, David. It, it's just important to me to clarify who I am and who I'm not. I'm not an economist, although I talk about the economy a lot. Mm -hmm. It's something that's very passionately interesting to me. But I did start out as a research scientist, and I also got an MBA. I was off in the business world for quite a while. And uh, this makes it, I'm comfortable with numbers. I'm comfortable with data. I like, I like to let the information tell the story. And there's an incredible story out there to be told about our economy. I was calling for the downturn that we're living through a number of years before it started. Uh, there's some other things coming now that I think everybody should be aware of. But I want to absolutely not misrepresent myself and say I, I'm an economist. And uh, actually, I think that's a good thing to be these days because, let's face it, almost all of them missed this story. Well, you know, I don't know if it is because some people tell me that I'm an, econ an economist. They have an MBA and an undergraduate degree in economics. And some people say that that makes me ostensibly some kind of an economist. And I, have, I had absolutely, absolutely no idea, no foresight about what was going, on, going to happen specifically beyond the fact that I knew it was really easy to get a mortgage. I saw that there was a lot of, a lot of leverage and bizarre uh, derivative instruments kind of floating around and being in increasingly used as high profit centers for a lot of the financial uh, companies. So I don't even know that there is a strong advantage to being a so-called economist, at least not one at my level, so to speak. I think someone with kind of the more technical numbers training you have may even be more useful. Well, I came at it from the outside, from the outside in. There, there were, like you say, there's some things that I just trust my gut on. When I saw that, that there, was, there was a hairdresser in Las Vegas, she had 19 homes and was, was accumulating more and more. And the idea there was that she was just going to be able to sell them for more money to someone else. That, that's like the classic shoeshine boy giving tips to J.P. Morgan in 1929 moment. You know, there were a number of moments that were stacking up for me that said, doesn't smell right, doesn't look right, and then I would go in with that hypothesis, dig around for the data, and the more I dug, the stinkier it got. I, honestly, once you put it all in one spot, it's pretty clear that we were going way off the bubble edge. So you are a former Fortune 300 VP. Can you say what company that's with? Which, which of these top 300 companies? It was called Science Applications International Corp. Still is. It was private at the time I was there, and it's now a public company. And what, what do they do? They do uh, mostly uh, uh, defense contracting and other government contracting. That's two-thirds of business. One-third is commercial. I was on the commercial side. I was a consultant uh, in the pharma industry at that point. And what, so tell, I, I know on your website you, you outlined somewhat briefly how you transitioned out of that and into what you do now, but kind of sum it up for us a little bit. The, the, the before and after stories kind of uh, stark for a lot of people. Before I came in contact with the information that's now on my website, and it's freely available to anybody who wants to see it, I was living in a five-bathroom house on the coast of Connecticut, waterfront home. I had a boat in the slip, Fortune 300 vice president. I come in contact with this information, start unraveling it, look at it, and my wife and I decided we had to make some changes. At this point, I'm 42. I have three young children, completely ditched the job, the house, everything, and uh, moved to this region of the world up here in Montague, Mass, is where I live now. And we did that because we saw some changes coming that we realized that the lifestyle that we were living was not the one that we wanted to be in when these changes came. So, for instance, with this economic downturn coming, we decided we didn't really want to be holding a big real estate asset of the kind that we thought would decline. That was a very wise move. And what year was this? That was in 2003 when we made the move. So this was well early on. This was 2003 really in the middle of the housing bubble, is it not? Yeah, we were still running up. The peak of the housing bubble was 2005, um, but I wasn't selling the house at that time specifically to dodge the real estate bubble. There were other things that, that I was dodging at that point in time, I thought. And... So we started on this journey that we've been on because we saw some things that frankly made us afraid. And once we made this transition to a different lifestyle, to a new community, to uh, a much deeper, richer set of connections, now this is something we would have actively done because it's, it's desirable, hmm. more the carrot than the stick. And we have no regrets. It's absolutely the right decision for our family. Uh, but from the American standpoint, it looks like I fell off the American dream bandwagon with a thud. Right? I, I had everything. Well, I, but there may, was there a golden parachute here? 
No, no golden parachute. Okay, because I, I know we'll, we will get that question. We will get when you say that you that it's a sad story in a sense, or, or it may seem like a sad story. The golden parachute might make it not quite as sad, right? No, no. This was uh, the, no parachute involved in okay. this particular exit. Golden or otherwise. No. Okay. No. Go on. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so here we are now, and I've spent the past five years trying to tell people that there was this big economic hiccup coming, but it's a larger story than that. The economy is the first D I talk about. The second D is energy. And there's a huge story there to be told about where we're heading with energy. The next 5, 10, 20 years are going to be just completely unique in human experience. We've always had one more horizon, one new coal seam, one new energy source. You know, some, some critics like to say, well, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, implying that we're not going to run out of the oil age because we're going to run out of oil. It's a completely different process. People move from stones to bronze to steel and so on. We went from coal to, to oil. Uh, now what? And that's the thing. Nobody can credibly say what's it, that question mark around that E. And then the third E is around uh, the environment. And for me, that's really a story about how we're depleting the resources on this planet. I don't care if we're talking about tuna fish or copper or topsoil or freshwater and aquifers. We are ripping through uh, the base resources of this world that, that give us the lifestyles we like to lead, give us the communities we live in, our, our whole culture, our whole sense of, of standard of living. Everything is dependent on taking out not just a little bit more every year, but an exponentially larger amount every year. Hmm. We have to take out more and more and more. And that story of more is coming to a pretty interesting conclusion, if not in my adult lifetime, certainly in my children's. Hmm. So this well, uh, and, and we'll get, and I have specific questions about that. And before we get to that, I, in looking at your website, which by the way, we're speaking with Chris Martinson. The website is chrismartinson.com and that's M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. Um, I get advertisements all the time for crash courses, e-books, learning seminars, so on and so forth. I mean, it is constant. And some of the ones I get in the mail are an incredible amount of paper. Just, just using the paper I get from people wanting me to follow their stock picks or learn about how they see the economy going in the next couple of years, I could write scripts for two years for this show, literally. Are you giving investment advice on your website? Tell us about this crash course and how is it? It, it looked to me to be different from some of these others, and in some ways it looked to be the same. So I, I think for our audience it would be good to know what exactly goes on on chrismartinson.com. The premier offering we've got is something called the Crash Course. It's 20 video chapters, uh, you know, four minutes long, ten minutes long, varying. And I put that out there with absolutely no business model and with, with no expectation. This was my mission-driven work. I, I had this information. It was so important. It caused me to change my life and my family's. And I thought I couldn't just sit on this as a product that I was then going to sell to people. So I made it free. Hmm. And anybody can watch that. It's now translated into three full languages on the basis of volunteers. Uh, the Spanish people came out first and got into Spanish. French, Italian are almost done with it. And it's going into nine other languages all around the world. And again, all for free. Uh, and I do offer a newsletter for subscribers, but that's not investment advice. It's really my big picture looking where I'm gathering data and information. I, I call myself an information scout. It's what I do. So I read things and I pull it all together. I might write about oil or I might write about where agriculture is going, whatever sort of you know, hot at that moment for me. In, in one interview I read with you, you said there's no safe place to hide financial assets during a downturn and that the system is in and of itself kind of rigged against small investors, which I think almost everybody is a small investor if we look at just 100% of the, in, the, in, the, number, the investors that are around. Um, is, does it make sense to just let your money sit under the mattress? I mean, in what ways do you, you say move into the non-financial types of assets? What, what does that mean? I think to some people it would be a little uh, confusing. Uh, David, this is a huge subject, but my primary uh, thesis on all this is that we had this huge run-up in stocks. It started in 1982, ran up through around 2000. In fact, we just closed the books on this decade, and stocks returned a negative return for the whole decade. But still, after 10 years, that's not long enough. Some people are still fixated on stocks. The way I look at it, we had a huge stock bubble through the 90s. It burst. And the Federal Reserve did everything it could, and it pushed, and it created another bubble, this time in housing. That expanded and burst with even larger economic uh, problems for people. My belief is that everybody's going to then get squeezed into the third bubble, this next one, which is going to follow, and this is going to be in bonds. And if this is true, then Treasury bonds would be my number one candidate for something that's in an enormous bubble right now. 
Uh, and Even though they're earning almost nothing, right? Well, that's why they're in a bubble, because when bonds yield almost nothing, it means their price is very right. high. Inversely, re yeah, they're uh, inversely related. So the price on treasuries, given the fact the United States ran a $1.8 trillion deficit this year, it's an amazing, I mean, this is banana republic territory kind of stuff, and still treasuries are yielding a very low amount only because the Federal Reserve has been stepping in and buying and supporting that market right. with some help from other foreign central banks. So I believe that that's a, you know, when everybody knows something, that's when I get uncomfortable. And everybody knows that treasuries are the safest place to park your money. Hmm. I think that's just another bubble that's waiting to be revealed as an illusion. And so the primary purpose of a bear market is to take everybody's wealth away. And it's not just a bear market in stocks. This is a bear market across our society at this point in time. So equities burst, pop, housing, pop. I think there's a third one waiting out there, whether it happens this year or three or five years out. It's really something that people, if they can see it coming, can position themselves to avoid it. I so, a lot so of give us avoid a, pain. give us a few examples of these non. I think I have it here. You say um, no, that out of the financial system altogether is where people should be moving some of their assets. How does how does one do that? What's an example of that? Well, right now, if you're in the financial system, people say, "Well, I'm diversified. My my stockbroker's got me. I'm well diversified." Real but, estate, stocks, bonds. Right. Right. But you're not if you're a hundred percent exposed to the dollar. Hmm. It means that you still have one primary diversification you haven't undertaken, which is if the dollar really tanks in some meaningful way, all of your other holdings will tank. And the purpose is not to gain wealth, it's to just preserve purchasing power during a primary bear market. That's where I think we are, and that's everything tells me we're still there, recovery, green shoots notwithstanding. So what I like to do is take some of my money and have it out of the paper dollar market. I, I moved a lot of my wealth and people who listened to me into gold and silver back in 2003. And now I'm keenly looking at primary production of wealth. I think we're going back to the old story. If you took a picture of this town in 1880, you would see where the wealth was. It was located in the most fertile valley bottoms. It was located near the stream that had the water the flowing that you could utilize. It was where the best timber was growing. Those were the people who had the real wealth were sitting on, on those primary assets. So farming is where we want to go. Absolutely. I think farming <laughs> is where we're going to go. Everybody should be, should be working the land is what you're suggesting. And improving the land, not just working it. There's, there's farming where you strip mine the soil, and there's farming where you improve the soil. It's that latter one that I really think is where the future is. Let's assume that not everybody is going to take that advice. We're still going to have people working in the medical field, insurance, retail, so on and so forth. Is gold, are gold and silver really the answer? I mean, in radio right now, there's a huge trend of these gold advertisers. There's Roslyn Capital, Gold Line, so on and so forth. There's, there's a whole bunch of these. If you turn on commercial radio, you hear advertisements for gold. Uh, I even went to a talk radio seminar, and the gold people are at the talk radio seminar presenting on gold is at the highest value in I don't know how many years. To me, that sounds like it's still the financial market, though, is it not? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a commodity that has a price that fluctuates similar to a stock. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, the number of people who are now piling into it makes me nervous. I am, by definition, a contrarian investor. I loved it when everybody hated it. I'm a little bit nervous about it now. Because more people are into gold. Yes. When, it, when everybody piles into something, it's, it's not the place you want to be at the end of the day. Let's, uh, oh, yeah. But even still, one thing about the reason I like gold is that it's still the only other thing besides paper currency that I can find that sits in the vaults of central banks. It means it still has a monetary role. It's not playing one right now, but if it had no monetary value, no role, it was just another commodity, I believe the central banks would have disordered all of their gold holdings. They've had 30 years since the breaking of the gold standard in 1971 to do that, and they haven't. So I like to trust what people do more than what they say, and the central banks have been talking about gold as a barbarous relic, and they hate it and has no role, but they still got it. So that's where I take my cue on gold. Let me remind our audience, if they're just tuning in, we're speaking with Chris Martinson from chrismartinson.com, and that's M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about so-called green jobs. There's one side that says green jobs are the future, and this is, these are all kind of uh, utopian, very general statements. Green jobs are the future, green jobs are the future of the U.S. economy, so on and so forth. There's another side which criticizes green jobs and says they are a possible driver of short-term economic growth and recovery, but a lot of these jobs are temporary. A lot of so-called green jobs are energy retrofit type of jobs or installing so solar panels, so on and so forth. Where, where do you come down on that? I am absolutely on the side of, of green jobs and that we need them, but I'm going to have to put a little twist on this. The thing that I care about most, if I could create that utopian world, we would no longer ask the question, how much money does it cost to put this project in, or how much money are we going to get back from this project? 
we'd be asking the most important question, which is what is the energy return on the energy we're going to invest in this project? And by that basis, I think we, the world snaps into clear focus for me. So the investing world is not confusing to me at all when I look at it through this lens which says net free energy is the thing we care about most. That's what's left over after you put some energy in and you get some energy out. On that basis, corn-based ethanol is a dog. It is a complete disaster of a program. Insulating houses is a complete winner. Um, and this is when, and on small scale, we're talking about the amount of energy saved by adding additional insulation is more than the energy required to make and install the insulation? Correct. Is that the kind of comparison that you make? Absolutely. And so we would start evaluating all of our options and priorities in this country uh, based on net free energy. So we would understand, gee, do we want to put in a maglev train or would we rather upgrade uh, the barge system? Should we be putting more money into this kind of transportation? Hey, should we get carbon fiber cars with electric motors? We don't know because actually we don't know what the net free energy return is. We've never had a serious national commission to study this. I think we ought to have some sort of agency, well funded, that can answer these specific questions that it's one of the most important things we're going to look at. What should we be pursuing as a nation? Because we've got to shepherd the remaining energy we've got, but it also makes great business sense. And it makes good, it's absolutely the right business decision, but we don't look at it that way. We look at it through this other lens, which is, where's the money in all of this? And the problem with that is, is that so much of that landscape is distorted by subsidies that create odd pricing. And so I'm, I'm saying ultimately that the dollar and the value we see is not giving us the right story. And mm. we need to sort of break that down. And when we do that, I think that's where green jobs just absolutely snap into clear focus, and a lot of them make incredibly good sense. So Maybe not in, all of them, but short, a lot of them. you're not too concerned about green jobs as a whole being highly temporary jobs that may make the economy seem better on paper in the short term but won't really add long term to the, to the productivity? You're not, that's not a concern for you? No, quite the opposite. I think that green jobs are going to be with us for a very long time, and we're going to have to be even smarter and more clever and we're going to need bright, young, shiny kids getting minted out of college who really understand it's very highly complicated and technical to do these things right. And uh, I'm a huge supporter of it. In the last couple of minutes we have, Michael Clare was here a few months ago. He's the uh, defense correspondent for The Nation, and he's written the, the book Blood and Oil, which was turned into a movie, and a very interesting guy to talk to. And when we were talking about alternative energy and specific alternative energies and renewable sources of energy, he was very, very big on right away if we start, I don't know, using half electric cars or something like that, right away we're going to see the benefit. And my question to him as, as kind of an umbrella question was, if we go to electric cars, they need to be charged, and where's the electricity coming from? It may very well be coming from coal or non-renewable resources. And he said, I don't care about that because those will run out and we'll have no choice but to eventually go all the way up the chain to renewable. But I hear you saying that you think there will be a change before they actually run out, that we didn't stop using stones because we ran out of stones. There were new technologies. How can we, where, what would be your reaction to that? Is it, is it that likely that we'll be off oil before we're out of it because there will be new technology? Or is it more likely that there just won't be any oil left and we'll have no choice? Well, the thing is we're not going to ever just run out of oil. We're going to run out of it slowly. You know, so we're going to have 3% less per year, uh, probably starting in a, in a couple of years. And we'll have to manage that downslope. And my hope is that we don't go to war over it and we find more clever ways. If we find the clever ways and if we're smart about it, we absolutely can start making the transition over to renewables. The mistake would be in thinking that we can seamlessly just go over to renewables and there's all the energy we need sitting there. It's not that easy. We're going to have to reconfigure and refashion a lot of things, where we live, where we work, where products come from, how close we live to food. All of that stuff is going to be part of that transition. Hmm. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it, but we have to get serious about it. And I was just talking with somebody who's spearheading a project to give us a smart grid in this country that's going to really upgrade our electrical lines and give us these special uh, uh, utility meters that will allow us to really partition the energy we've got much more creative. They're getting nowhere on it. It's really hard. It's going to take $40 billion. Senators can't agree. And by the way, $40 billion is about a tenth of what the Treasury just signed off on uh, on an unlimited cap to Fannie and Freddie. And when you say smart grid, you mean a gr an electrical grid that will actually distribute ele electricity kind of in a, on a dynamic level as mm -hmm. needed and as produced, yep. as opposed to what? What is there now? What's, what's a dumb grid, so to speak? A dumb grid just basically says, you know, we think we need, a, a, you know, 30 gigawatts in this quadrant roughly between these hours. And so we flip on, you know, these giant plants and we pump all that electricity in there, whether it's actually needed or not. A dynamic system looks at all the individual loads and is finding out what's needed at different point sources, sending all that information back. In real time. In real time. 
And it's also giving feedback to the consumer saying, hey, you could turn your AC on right now, but this is the most expensive electricity you can buy, maybe if you waited a little while. So it, it provides both, both a push and a pull hmm. that's helping to distribute the load so we don't need to build that next new plant. We can possibly get away with the ones we've got or maybe even decommi decommission a few at this point. Politically, where do you come down? Are we, were you an Obama or McCain guy? You know, I, at my site, I don't take any partisan stance whatsoever because I think my message has to reach everybody, and I'd hate to slam any doors by saying where I fall in the political spectrum. I, I also don't release my religious views, all kinds of things, and it's because this story is too important. But you to do vote. Boxed. You did vote for someone. Absolutely. And are you happy with how Barack Obama is handling some of these issues of energy and the economy? Um, I'm happy on some. I'm very displeased on others. On the economy, I'm going to have to give them a D minus. I couldn't detect any daylight between administrations. It really looked to me like the people who are calling the shots on this whole bailout, the stimulus, uh, really, because there was no change between administrations, I got a, a very discomforting view about who's really calling the shots down there. And I don't think it was the administrations at this point. Hmm. We've been speaking with Chris Martinson. The website, chrismartinson.com, is M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. Thank you so much for coming in today. David, my pleasure.